Um, so first, thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it's always nice to be in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and let me start by saying that this is joint work with a lot of people. Cristobal Guzman, who's now in Amsterdam, Vincent Roulet, who's next door, Nicolas Boumal, who's now in Princeton, and Martin Yagi, who's now at uh, EPFL. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, affine invariant uh, optimization methods, but the title is a bit abstract, and, but the, 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 idea, the general <coughs> idea of what we're trying to do here is, is fairly simple. So in general, a complexity bound looks like this. Yeah, I mean, just, it's just an example. Okay, so n log n divided by epsilon, for example. Epsilon is the target precision, and n is the dimension of your problem. Okay? If you're lucky, it looks like this. Okay? And you have a little bit more information about the link between the complexity, your complexity bound, and the data. And this information is contained for optimization methods, for example, in uh, uh, some, a few regularity constants, for example, like L, the Lipschitz constant, etc. So there's a little bit more uh, explicit dependence between the structure of your data and the complexity estimate you get on solving a particular optimization problem. Okay? But, but overall, what's, what's seriously missing in all these bounds is, is the data itself. Okay? So, this link between the structure of the data and uh, the complexity bound, depending on the method, of course, is, is usually fairly weak. And, and which means that, in particular, the, the, the bounds are not that informative. And, um, and so that's the sort of broad issue I'm trying to uh, uh, discuss here. Okay, so there's, at least on, on scalable methods in optimization, there's a huge gap between the worst case performance we display in these bounds and the actual performance of the methods. And um, so, and, and this gap is, is, is there because the, the way the data itself materializes in the bounds is extremely coarse, okay? So the, overall, the, the question today is, can we derive more data-driven complexity bounds? So complexity bounds that def uh, depend in a much more refined way on the data itself. And um, in, in certain cases, this is an interesting issue uh, uh, for, for very specific reasons. For example, when we try to study the, the sort of computational complexity versus statistical performance trade-off. We know this trade-off exists. It shows up everywhere in compressed sensing, etc. Uh, so basically, uh, whenever you, you require high statistical performance because, for example, you have fewer samples, uh, you need to make a much stronger computational investment. And, and at this point, we have sort of points on this trade-off curve, but we don't know exactly where the curve comes from. Okay? So clearly, if your, statistical, your problem is statistically harder, you're going to need to invest more numerical work, uh, but we don't know where this mechanism comes from, okay? And the part of the reason, at least I believe, because the, for, uh, for, for which we don't know, uh, we don't know how to identify this, this trade-off or, or identify the structure or the nature of this trade-off is because, again, our complexity bounds for optimization techniques or algorithms in general are, are very, very poorly linked to the data, okay? And so, of course, this is a much too broad uh, I mean, this question is way too broad, so I'm just going to focus on two specific uh, uh, questions today. The first one is to derive affine invariant complexity bounds on, on certain classical optimization techniques. Okay? So if you take an optimization problem uh, and you do an affine change of coordinates, you shouldn't expect anything major to happen in, in, to you, the complexity of the problem. Okay? You're not changing its nature. Okay? Yet in many cases, unfortunately, this affine change of coordinates will have a major impact on your complexity bounds for uh, most method, uh, optimization methods that solve these convex optimization uh, problems. Okay? So we have this the, the obvious gap between the theory and uh, the, the problem we're trying to solve. The, the problem itself doesn't change. Our bound does change in a major way. Okay? How can we fix that? So that's the first point I'm going to try to address. The second one is going to be a lot more specialized. I'm going to, I'm going to illustrate a scenario where uh, we are lucky, and the same quantity drives at the same time both computational complexity and 
um, uh, statistical performance. And this is in compressed sensing in a classical scenario. You have one value that allows you to at, at the simultaneously bound the computational complexity of certain methods to solve a compressed sensing problem and control the quality of the recovered estimate. Okay? So in that case, we're lucky. There, there's no explicit connection between these two things. I'm going to uh, really go fast on the technical discussion. Uh, but uh, the, the, the objective in both cases is to, again, try to identify complexity bounds that are much closer to uh, the structure of the data, much more closely related to the structure of the data. So affine invariant bounds on, on uh, convex optimization problems uh, first. Uh, so the, the problem we're trying to solve here is very generic. We're trying to minimize a convex function over a simple convex set. And the definition of simple here is not so simple, so I'm not going to uh, detail it immediately, but, but this is a very generic optimization problem. It shows up everywhere yeah, in stats, etc. cetera. Uh, and so we're going to assume throughout the, 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 this, the first part of this talk that f is convex and smooth. And I'm going to make smooth the definition of smooth more precise later. And same thing, we're, we're going to assume that Q is compact, convex, and simple. And again, I'm going to make the definition of simple more explicit later. OK? Very generic problem. And if, if the, the scale of this problem is reasonable, we, we have a completely satisfactory theory uh, and, and a numerical set of, uh, a set of numerical methods to solve it. Uh, uh, and bound the, the performance of these solvers. Okay? Newton's method sort of closes the, the topic of solving uh, reasonably large convex optimization problems. So just a quick reminder, in Newton's method, the argument is fairly simple. Uh, you locally approximate your function by a quadratic, you minimize the quadratic, and you repeat. Minimizing the quadratic roughly means taking a step in the direction given by the normalized gradient, the gradient being normalized by the Hessian. And uh, this works in particular if you assume that the function f, you make an additional sort of reasonable uh, regularity assumption on the function. You assume that it's self-concordant. And self-concordant means this inequality between the third and the second derivative of the function. The first time you see it, your first impression is what? Uh, but, uh, but in practice, uh, this makes complete sense. Uh, first, this, this, the powers here are, are, are there to make the uh, condition affine invariant, which is good. Okay? And then when you think about it for two minutes, this does two things at the same time. It's a lower bound on the second uh, derivative of the function, so it means the function is roughly strongly convex. And it's at the same time an upper bound on the third derivative of the function which means that your quadratic approximation of the function doesn't change too much. And this is exactly what you need to make a sort of sequential quadratic approximation uh, method work efficiently on, on these minimization problems. I'm going very fast. This is just for sort of uh, uh, broadly general cultural objectives, but, uh, but uh, this is really key. And, and Everything that preserves convexity more or less preserves self-concordance. Self-concordance is affine invariant, etc. So no, no one even thinks about this condition anymore. It holds for all the problems you care about, period. Okay? And so you make two additional regularity assumptions. They are fairly innocent. Uh, first, of course, your objective is self-concordant. And the set Q has a self-concordant barrier. So you can maintain your iterates inside the set Q using a penalty in the objective. And this penalty also satisfies this regularity assumption. I'm going fast because this is classical material. It's just to give a little bit of background. But uh, it's not my main point today. Uh, and so the, the key result in, in optimization in the last 20 years or so, at least at, at small scale, is that uh, uh, if you make these assumptions, then you can have a very clean complexity estimate on, on the complexity of solving the problem I just detailed using Newton, Newton's method. And this complexity estimate looks like this. And uh, so it depends on the target precision, but only through a log-log term. And for all reasonable values of epsilon, this is like 6. OK? So this term doesn't exist. And then the, the left-hand sign on this complexity bound, so the, again, the number of iterations of Newton's method you need to solve the problem, uh, the minimization problem up to precision epsilon, 
Well, it depends on a, a factor here times the difference between the value of the function you're trying to minimize at the initial iterate and the optimum. Okay? And this factor here depends on parameters alpha and beta that you set. They're line search parameters, and more or less, uh, alpha is 0.1 and beta is 0.5. Okay? So this is a constant. So the, the theory, what the theory says for uh, uh, the complexity of Newton's method on, self -con on minimizing self-concordant functions is that the number of Newton iterations is bounded by something that is basically something like 375, if you evaluate the factor I just cited for reasonable values of alpha and beta, times the, the difference between the initial value of the function and your, uh, the optimum, plus 6. Okay? And that bound actually works. So it's, it's also verified empirically. Um, and what's impressive about this bound is what's not in there. So in particular, it's independent from the dimension. And again, this is verified empirically. And finally, uh, because of its simplicity, this bound is affine invariant. Okay? So you make an innocent, completely innocent affine change of coordinates to your function and nothing happens. The Newton's method just uh, works exactly as it did in the original coordinates. Okay, and so of course, uh, at each iteration, you still need to solve for the Newton step, uh, and that heavily depends on the complexity and the structure of your problem, uh, but that's just linear algebra. So you know exactly how to measure and control the cost. Okay? So basically, uh, for reasonably large convex optimization problem, we have a complete theory on the complexity of solving uh, these problems, and the, the theory very, very closely matches uh, what uh, uh, empirical evidence shows. Okay? So that problem is just completely solved. And, and I, I think one of the key uh, 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 aspects of, of the bounds I ju uh, just cited is the fact that uh, uh, the invariance of the bound uh, matches the invariance of the algorithm. And that was really the key advance in, in the results by Nesterov and Nimerovsky in the uh, mid-90s. Uh, the previous analysis of, of Newton's method was not affine invariant, even though the method itself was. Okay? And that meant that the, the bounds you would get were obviously completely out of line. Okay? Uh, and so this was really the major uh, breakthrough in the, the mid-90s. Uh, so that's the nice and friendly world of uh, medium-scale optimization problems, convex optimization. We know everything there is to know about them, more or less. Uh, unfortunately, at one point, beyond a certain scale, computing the, forming the Hessian, and, and then solving the, the, the system of equations that gives you the Newton step, is completely out of reach. Okay? If you're solving large-scale statistical problems, there is no way you can form the Hessian and solve that system. Okay, it just doesn't happen. For a long time, people hoped that by doing clever linear algebra, randomization tricks, etc., etc., we could salvage some of the performance of Newton's method at very large scale. It's not true, or it doesn't seem to be true. So you have to switch to other types of algorithms and give up on second order information. And f until now, basically, if you give up on second order information, you lose affine invariance. And if you lose affine invariance, you completely break the link. Uh, you have no hope of, of producing reasonably accurate complexity bounds for your optimization problem. Okay? So large scale means using first order methods, just a gradient. Uh, you can do a lot of things with the gradient, but you only have access to a gradient oracle. And, um, and if, if you do uh, optimization with only a gradient, getting a fine invariance is, tr is tricky. Okay? And so that's the main question I'm going to discuss today. Okay? How can we produce clean, affine invariant bounds, uh, complexity bounds for some uh, classical uh, convex optimization algorithms? Well, it turns out that, uh, unfortunately, uh, affine invariants for convex optimization methods that, that only use first order information are more the exception than the whole. And um, <clears throat> one, of, uh, one of these methods that actually has a clean complexity estimate that turns out to be affine invariant 
is the old Frank Wolf method, also known as Fedorov or uh, conditional gradient. Okay, and what you do at each iteration is very simple. You compute a gradient and you minimize over the feasible set an affine uh, form given by the gradient. You get a, a vertex or an extreme point of the feasible set and you average this point with your previous iterates and miraculously this thing converges to the optimum. And even more miraculously, you can bound the number of iteration, it, iterations it takes to, to reach a precision epsilon by CF divided by epsilon, where CF is an affine invariant bound on the quadratic variation of your function. Okay? And so, for this method at least, we do have a nice, clean, invariant uh, complexity bound. The main problem is that the dependence in epsilon is suboptimal in many cases. And in particular, when the function is smooth, meaning it has a Lipschitz continuous gradient, uh, what uh, uh, computation, uh, computation complexity theory tells you is that the lower bound on complexity should be 1 over square root of epsilon. Uh, and this bound is actually reached by uh, some methods. Okay? So this method has the nice invariance property we are looking for. Unfortunately, its dependence on the target precision is, is significantly suboptimal. Okay? And so uh, the method that one of the methods that, that reaches the optimum complexity is the algorithm developed by Nesterov in the 80s. Uh, and what this algorithm does, I'm going to detail it very briefly, but it, again, this is not the main uh, issue today. Uh, it, it requires you to choose a norm, OK? And assume that the gradient of the function you're trying to minimize is Lipschitz with uh, constant L with respect to that particular norm. Once you've chosen that norm, you also need to choose a prox function uh, uh, and then assume that your prox function is strongly convex with respect to the original norm with parameter sigma. Okay? So you choose a norm and you choose a prox function and then what the method does is basically solve uh, some auxiliary minimization problems at each iteration Forget about the details. These are just glorified projection steps in most cases, so they're easy. But they, of course, depend heavily on the prox and on the norm. Okay? And the good news about that method is that, again, it only uses gradient information. Uh, but you can bound the number of iterations by something that is the square root of the Lipschitz constant of the gradient, uh, something that is essentially a diameter divided by epsilon, uh, times the uh, sigma, the strong convexity constant of the prox. Okay? And now, the dependence on epsilon is optimal. It's 1 over square root of epsilon instead of 1 over epsilon. You do 10 iterations instead of 100, so it, it, it really matters. Um, unfortunately, uh, the constant L here and the value of this uh, normalized prox vary heavily with affine changes of coordinates meaning that typically this bound is way off empirical performance. And it doesn't really tell you anything about the true empirical complexity of your problem. OK? And, so the, the, and it's because it's written using quantities that cannot be affine invariant. So you need, the idea is to bound the complexity of the, this same method, uh, but using quantities that are invariant, uh, instead of using uh, these Lipschitz and, and, and diameters that, that cannot be a fine invariant. And, and the reason why this particular algorithm is important is that, well, there aren't too many algorithms that are, have this optimal complexity. They, they're all directly related to this one in some sense. And also, this is very heavily used on, on large-scale problems. Uh, so compressed sensing, etc. So getting a good idea of empirical performance for these methods is actually a pretty important problem. OK? And it turns out that the key to making the method affine invariant is to derive a principled way of choosing the norm and choosing the prox. OK? Uh, and, and this can have a major impact on complexity uh, in itself. So I'm going to skip over this example really fa skim over this example very fast, but this is a matrix game problem. For example, you're minimizing a bilinear function over a, a simplices. Um, and 
depending on your choice of prox, if you pick a squared Euclidean norm, what you get is a complexity bound that looks like this. If you pick instead an L1 norm and a prox that is uh, uh, entropy, and then your complexity bound looks like this. Okay? So again, there is a huge impact on the constants that appear in the complexity bound of the um, uh, choice of norm and choice of prox. And for example, when A is a Bernoulli matrix, this is roughly, uh, there is a roughly a factor, a square root of n between this bound and this one. Okay? So choosing the norm and choosing the prox has a major impact on the actual complexity of solving the method. Okay? So the idea here is to choose the norm and choose the prox in a principled way. Um, to make sure that in the end uh, these choices of prox and norm are invariant with respect to an affine change of coordinates because we need affine invariance and uh, allow us to define regularity constants that are themselves invariant with respect to affine change of coordinates. And so when you think about it, all the information you have and, and you're allowed to exploit to choose the norm, choose the prox, and make the complexity bound affine invariant has to be contained in the optimization problem you're looking at. Okay? If you take one reference point or make one decision that does not explicitly depend on your problem, you cannot get invariance. Okay? So you have an optimization problem, you minimize a function over a convex set, and from this optimization problem you need to define a norm and you need to define a prox. Okay? And there is an obvious choice of norm whenever Q is centrally symmetric. Okay? Take the Minkowski gauge and you get a norm. And that's what we're going to do. So for now we're going to assume that Q is centrally symmetric, has non-empty interior, etc. And so Q defines a norm. So you have this optimization problem and the feasible set gives you an obvious cho choice of norm. And the first piece of good news you get when you do that is that now when you compute the Lipschitz constant of uh, the gradient of f, one piece of the complexity estimate we just detailed, uh, this regularity constant, this Lipschitz constant, turns out to be invariant with respect to an affine change of coordinates uh, for your problem. You do an affine change of coordinates, the set q is going to change, your choice of norm is going to change accordingly, Hence, the constant L uh, will be defined with respect to a new norm. And it turns out that this choosing Q as uh, your definition for the norm, as the unit ball of your norm, makes the definition of the regularity constant of the gradient of the function F invariant with respect to an affine change of coordinates. It's a few lines. It, uh, it's a, nothing special. But at least we have now a choice of norm that makes at least one, the first part of the complexity bound invariant with respect to an affine change of coordinates. Okay? The same is true for strong convexity. Remember, we, we had two uh, uh, regularity constants in the complexity estimate of Nesteros method. The first one was the Lipschitz constant of the gradient. The second one was the strong convexity of the prox. Both are invariant with respect to an affine change of coordinate if Q is taken to be uh, is derived directly from the feasible set. So the choice of norm it, it, when Q is centrally symmetric is fairly obvious. What's uh, slightly trickier is choosing the prox. So remember the prox was this function that was used in one of the projection steps in the algorithm. Okay? And uh, so now that we have chosen a norm, we need to choose a prox function. The norm might not be regular, and we need the prox function to be regular, so we need to find some kind of approximation of the norm to, to get a prox. So two quick definitions for before I, I, I show you how to choose a prox in this case. Uh, the first is this super classical definition on the banach mazur distance between uh, uh, two norms. Okay, it's the distortion. Uh, uh, so uh, suppose A and B uh, allow you to bound one norm using another here. Uh, the uh, distortion between these two norms is the smallest product AB such that this is true. Okay? And it just shows you how uh, close the norm X is to the norm Y in a multiplicative way. 
Okay, so that's classical. What's a little bit less classical and is a sort of a happy accident is the definition of the regularity constant of a ba Banach uh, space. Okay? So this definition comes from a paper by Yuditsky and Miowski in 2008, uh, but on a completely different topic. And it turned out by some happy accident to be exactly the quantity we needed, or the dual of the quantity we needed, but who cares? And um, uh, it, so it, it allows you to do two things at once and trade off between the, these two things. So the regularity constant of a Banach is the smallest constant delta, strictly positive, for which there exists a smooth norm P, such that P square is Lipschitz continuous, has a Lipschitz continuous gradient with respect to the norm P, first thing. And the constant here is between 1 and delta, first point we need. Second, the norm P itself is not too far away from the original norm. Uh, and the distortion is, is controlled by a uh, square root of capital delta divided by mu. So regularity means doing two things at the same time. You want to approximate the norm in your Banach space by a smooth norm. And you want that approximation to be reasonably close. And at the same time, you want your smooth norm to be reasonably smooth. Okay? And you trade off between these two objectives, and that's how you get uh, the regularity constant delta. Okay? Comes from uh, getting bounds on, on uh, I mean, Martingale inequalities. It's, it's somehow unrelated, but it turned out to be exactly the quantity we needed. Once you have these two definitions, so the P here in the regularity constant will give you the prox. We have L affine invariant because of our choice of norm from the set Q. What you can show using these two constructions is that if F has a Lipschitz continuous gradient with constant LQ with respect to your choice of norm Q, and the uh, Banach space corresponding to that uh, dual norm, just because there's this extra duality, uh, duality step, is DQ regular, then the smooth algorithm uh, the, the, in Nestor of 2005, which is essentially that in uh, 1983, will produce a solution with precision epsilon in, at most, square root of LQ DQ divided by epsilon steps. And now, first, we have the optimal dependence on epsilon. Second, the bound we obtain here is invariant with respect to an affine change of coordinates because LQ is and DQ is as well. Okay? And so, without using second order information, like in the Newton case, we get a complexity bound on a convex optimization problem using uh, an optimal first order algorithm that does not depend, uh, vary with affine changes of coordinates in your problem. Okay? So, that's the first uh, uh, piece of good news. Uh, so we can show that uh, CF, the curvature, is a lower bound on this thing. But there's one important element missing uh, in, in, in this uh, result. Okay? So it, it's nice to have affine invariance, right? So among the many choices you get for the product L, D of X star divided by sigma, uh, this is one where... Uh, the bound you get is invariant with respect to an affine change of coordinates. Unfortunately, what this result doesn't tell you is, is this the best possible choice for the product LQDQ? For example, the worst possible choice of Lipschitz constant diameter product will also be invariant with respect to an affine change of coordinates. But it's not going to be a very helpful bound. Okay? So you want actually here two things. Of course, you want your complexity bound to be invariant with respect to an affine change of coordinate. But you also want your bound to be close to the minimum possible bound uh, with respect to all these affine change of coordinates. This is the quantity you care about. Meaning you want both the denominator to be optimal here, but also the numerator to be optimal. Okay? And so, we only have a partial answer for the second question, but fortunately, it's a partial yes. Okay? And that's easy to see because in certain cases, 
uh, in particular when Q is an LP ball, we know exactly what the computational complexity lower bounds should be. Okay? Uh, I, I'm just going to go relatively quickly over this, but for example, when uh, we're optimizing over a simplex, it makes sense to pick uh, the L1 norm as uh, your particular choice of norm. When you do that, uh, you know exactly how to compute the prox uh, using the regularity assumption I, I just uh, detailed. And in the end, the bound you get is L1, the square root of uh, L1 times log n divided by epsilon, knowing that the optimum complexity lower bound uh, is actually closer to 8 times L1 times log n over epsilon. Okay? So this reasoning actually in certain particular cases, like the L1 ball over here, gives you the optimum uh, uh, bound. This, uh, yes? Question. Is that, in the last case, it seems, is that related to minimizing overall affine change of variables? Like yes, 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 yes. If you could, yes, you take the, if you could take the original bound and minimize it over affine changes of co uh, coordinates, mm -hmm. uh, you would get both a quantity that's affine invariant, obviously, yeah and also optimal, okay? We cannot do that, or at least we don't know how to do that for now, but in, in, uh, at least in getting affine invariance here, luckily, we also got optimality. Yeah, you get something close to that. With this yeah, point. yeah, there's a factor, et cetera, but, but roughly speaking, you seek affine invariance, and because this seems to be a good idea, you also get optimality as a byproduct, okay? <laughs> um, so, uh, a few more things we can say about uh, just uh, coming from this bound. Uh, uh, just by looking at LQ, you know that uh, on easy problems, the norm is going to be large in directions where uh, the gradient is large, okay? Because then LQ can be small. And that means that basically the sublevel sets of F and Q are aligned. And that makes sense because if the sublevel sets are of, of F and Q are aligned, uh, it means that uh, there is an affine change of coordinate that's going to make your problem roughly spherical, optimizing a spherical quadratic over a sphere. And that's basically the, the simplest uh, geometry you can hope for. Okay? And so uh, that makes complete sense, and it's a direct byproduct of the bound I just detailed. Uh, second um, uh, statement here, well, since a lot of the complexity depends on the regularity constant of the space over which you're optimizing, uh, it turns out that uh, you can uh, find an explicit expression for this regularity constant on LP balls. And, and this allows you to conclude, at least from the point of view of this complexity bound, that problems written over unit balls BQ for Q between 1 and 2 should be easier. And optimizing over cubes should be harder. But we knew that already from uh, complexity theory, but uh, the bound confirms it. Okay. So again, the, the last thing I need to show is that uh, this affine invariant choice of a product uh, L, L, LQ, DQ is, is actually optimal for a certain subclass of problems, okay? Because again, the worst possible choice of this product would also be affine invariant, but not particularly useful, okay? And it turns out to be the case, and, and this is just a matter of computing the regularity constant uh, DP for LP balls, uh, and this has been done, uh, for example, by Jizitsky and Mirovsky, it's classical, uh, and, um, and making sure that uh, the bound we get matches the information theoretical lower bounds we get on iteration complexity uh, for the entire range of P, and this happens to be the case. So in the range P, the bounds are, slightly, are handled slightly differently in the range P between 1 and 2, uh, the, the information theoretic bound is this, and what we get is this. And so we get optimality up to a polylog uh, factor, <coughs> a square of a log. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, that's fine. Uh, but okay, there's a square log uh, uh, too much here. And same thing in the range P between 2 and infinity, uh, the lower bound on, on, on complexity looks like this, and the bound we get looks like this. And again, we have an extra log. Uh, but this is no big deal. There's still a little bit of a gap in our uh, uh, tightness result, uh, which requires the number of iterations to be roughly proportional to the dimension of the problem. Otherwise, our bound uh, falls apart. 
Uh, it doesn't fall apart, but there's a gap. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that in a week or two we can fix it. Um, and so it turns out that here we're lucky. Not only do we get affine invariant bounds, but we also get bounds that turn out to be optimal uh, uh, among all the possible choices of affine invariant bounds up to a polylog term. Okay? So that was the first part of, of my result. So it turns out that you, it wasn't obviously uh, obvious at first that uh, using only first order information you could get affine invariant bounds mm -hmm. on the complexity of solving convex optimization problems uh, that are both affine invariant and optimal. And it turns out to be possible again if you can construct uh, the prox function p. And you, it turns out that on LP balls, at least, there's an explicit formulation for the prox function p. For generic problems, of course, this is another uh, story. Okay? But at least formally speaking, there's a way of making these optimal methods uh, affine invariant. And you hope that the complexity bound you get is, by construction, much closer to the empirical evidence. Okay? So good news, I hope. Uh, so this was a bit abstract. Okay, I haven't solved anything yet. I just uh, looked at problems on LP balls, etc. But uh, not much is going on in terms of numbers. So I'm switched to a slightly different topic, but in the same spirit. Uh, again, getting meaningful complexity bounds on, on optimization problems that are much closer to the application at hand. And, and in the second part, the application at hand will be compressed sensing. Okay. So we're trying to recover sparse vectors by solving underdetermined linear systems. We do that by solving convex optimization problems using sparsity inducing norms. Uh, can we quantify the complexity of these optimization problems and relate the complexity bounds to the complexity, the statistical performance of the method itself? And again, it turns out that the, the answer seems to be yes. Okay, so just a little bit of first, since I'm switching topics, any further questions or last uh, minute comments or anything like that? I'm sorry, I yes. I have a similar question. I don't understand when you say optimal, it's for that specific choice of the norm that you have? Or? Uh, so if you don't uh, have any more information on where is my uh, sort of more abstract, uh, more generic result. So suppose you, you don't have any more information on the problem you're trying to solve. Okay, so you, you only know that the gradient is, is Lipschitz uh, and that the set Q is simple, meaning you, you can solve these uh, uh, projection problems. Okay? Uh, optimal means that you can actually construct a problem that will require at least that many gradient, gradient evaluations to uh, get to a solution of precision epsilon. And there's an explicit construction. But there might be other constructions. So you're other constructions? Yeah, that, is, that are affine, but you are, are not considered here, no? Um, no, no. So what I mean is that uh, okay. this here cannot be improved. When, when both the denominator and the numerator are optimal, this cannot be improved without additional knowledge on your function. Because there will, so we have a low, a, an upper bound on the complexity of the entire class, and we have at least one problem that hits this upper bound. Okay? And without more information on, on the function we are trying to minimize or on Q, we, we cannot exclude that particular scenario. Of course, there's an asymmetry here, but that's totally classical. The, the upper bound is a much stronger result than the lower bound. So the upper bound tells you you can solve all these problems with that complexity. The lower bound just tells you there's one pathological problem that hits this bound, okay? And as soon as you open a little bit the kimono and you have a little bit more information about your function, typically all these counterexamples go away, okay? So optimality is until something, something else shows up, right? Okay? Um, okay. So I'm going to try to illustrate these questions on something a bit more specific. Okay? And there's no immediate link between the two parts, but the, the objectives are exactly the same. <coughs> so just a little bit of... Um, uh, so I said earlier that we have very few data-driven complexity bounds uh, for convex optimization. This is partially true. At least the closest thing we have to a data-driven complexity bound for convex optimization 
is something called Renegar's condition uh, number. So I'm sure you all have memories from uh, the numerical analysis and, uh, and linear algebra classes. You know that there's a condition number for linear systems that quantifies how reliable the solution will be and how fast you can solve them. Okay? Well, it, out, it turns out that you can extend this definition of conditioning to convex optimization. And this is what Renegard did in a sequence of papers in the early 2000s. And it turns out to be simpler to formulate on, on uh, uh, alternative conic linear systems. And forget about the details here, but a, a conic linear system is, is a, a primal dual set of equations where in the primal you're trying to find a vector x that solves ax is equal to zero, and x is in some cone c. And in the dual, you're, you're trying to find a vector y such that minus a transpose y is in the dual cone. Okay? Uh, and it turns out that this is the kind of system you write when you want to certify optimality of convex optimization problems. So uh, this is the tool we need here. And the one additional definition we need, well, we need a few more, but this is really the key. Um, you, for, for such a problem, you can define a, a distance to infeasibility. So suppose your, your primal problem is feasible. It has a solution. Suppose now that you perturb your data A. So you, you add some noise to the matrix A, and you make the magnitude of the noise increase. At one point, uh, uh, you're going to find a delta A, a, a noise uh, uh, term on, on perturbing your matrix A, such that A plus delta A, the system written using the perturbed matrix A plus delta A, becomes infeasible. Okay. So you start from A, and, and in A, your system is feasible. And then you look a little bit around this matrix A, around your original system, you add a bit of noise. And at some point when noise grows, you're going to be able to find a system that's not feasible. OK? Well, it turns out that the complexity, the computational complexity of an optimization problem, at least the ones I just detailed, is directly related to this distance to infeasibility. If you're trying to solve a problem that is very nearly infeasible, numerically, you're in deep trouble. Okay? On the other hand, if you try to solve a problem that is really clearly feasible and far away from infeasible instances, you're going to pay a much lower computational cost. Okay? And this is what Renegar formalized in his condition number. So the Renegar's condition number for a, a, an optimization problem P with respect to the point X star is defined as, as the scale invariant reciprocal of this distance to infeasibility. Okay? So what is uh, the, the second P uh, X star? It's probably, what is it should be? P is feasible, probably, right? Um, you, uh, no, no, no. So here, you want to touch, you, you don't want to touch um, um, the infeasible instances. So it's infeasible on the MP. But, so roughly speaking, you start from A, problem is feasible, and uh, you look at the, the minimum distance to an infeasible instance. Okay? The infeasible instances are the ones that... that so uh, forget about the definition. It's just a distance to a set of infeasible instances. You start from a feasible one, and you reach uh, 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 an infeasible one. And you should, should there should be number of N? Should there be a number of N? The, yeah. Uh, you're right, yes, there's a double negation, and uh, yeah, yeah the, okay, I see the point. Okay, yes, my, my bad. Um, uh, but uh, the, the, co the concept is this. And there's a symmetric statement for the dual. So you start from a dual feasible thing, and, and you reach a uh, dual infeasible, and so you can symmetrize these statements, but it just makes the definitions heavier, and there's no point. Uh, but so the one additional step you need to make is to normalize this thing uh, by the norm of, of, of A, take the inverse, and this is going to give you Renegar's condition number. And this thing essentially behaves like a condition number for linear systems, but it, it's tailored to uh, these optimization problems. Okay? And this is a purely data-driven uh, measure of complexity for optimization problems. This is something, unfortunately, it's not easy to compute this, but if you could, or in the instances where you can, it gives you a much more precise estimate of the complexity of a particular problem. Okay? Uh, at least take my word for it. 
Uh, and so, uh, I mean, not mine actually, but, but the, the, this has been heavily studied and there are both empirical and theoretical arguments to show the link between the two. So in particular, we have complexity bounds for uh, the ellipsoid, uh, uh, many other algorithms, and first, uh, sorry, interior point methods that depend directly on this condition number CA. Okay? So CA very nicely describes the uh, data-driven complexity of an, a particular type of optimization problems. Now, it turns out that for compressed sensing problems, we're, we are lucky. And so, if you look at a sparse recovery problem where you minimize an L1 norm here subject to uh, uh, approximation constraints on, on uh, AX matching observations Y, so you need, a, you, you try to find a, a sparse vector uh, matching uh, a, a set of linear observations, uh, the performance of this statistical uh, recovery uh, problem is controlled by, I mean, there are many ways to control it, but one way to do it is to look at conically restricted minimal singular values of the matrix A. And these are essentially singular values, but restricted to a, a particular cone that turns out to be the, descent, the cone of descent directions of your optimization problems. Okay? And using these this, this cone restricted eigenvalues or singular values, you can show that the, you can bound the difference between the true solution, the sparse one, and uh, the solution of your optimization problem. And it's bounded by, again, the norm of the matrix A divided by these cone restricted singular values. Right? The yes. restricted isometry property is like an extreme case of this. One controls this. Yeah, uh, it controls this. It's a slightly different set of conditions, but uh, this is a bit uh, finer, but it's roughly the same idea. So RIP is a way of controlling this, roughly speaking. But isn't the RIP not, um, it's over a bigger space, right? It wants to preserve these distances over almost the whole space, and this is, you're misunderstood. This is a... Uh, you're just a smaller cone than... than you, you want to control singular values, but on a, on a much smaller space, which is the space of sparse vectors. So RIP is essentially a, a condition number itself, okay. but it's only computed over sparse vectors. Uh, so it's a sparse condition in condition. And you're picking a cone which is bigger than this. I'm picking a cone that's slightly different, given by descent directions, but otherwise it's the same story exactly. And so you could write actually a version of this statement using RIP, but in my, my case, it makes a lot more sense to use these cone-restricted eigenvalues. And, and there is an infinite amount of literature on the link between these two properties and on the fine points of who's weaker than who, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go there. Uh, so, but but the, the key here is that mu controls statistical performance. If mu is big, you get good uh, estimates of the exact uh, sparse solution. And in this case, we are lucky because using classical results from Freund and Vera, for example, in 99, but there are many others, uh, you can show that uh, it, for these particular problems, so compressed sensing problems, cone restricted eigenvalues exactly match distance to infeasibility. Hence, the quantity that controls computational complexity in a data-driven way exactly matches the quantity that controls statistical performance in a data-driven way, okay? And this is exactly the kind of result you want. And it turns out to be the case, at least for compressed, these, these simple compressed sensing problems. And you can generalize this to a much broader class of uh, sparse recovery problems using matrices and so on. Uh, um, and so we've done that in a recent paper. Uh, and, and numerically it works. So I, I have to conclude this talk by numerical experiments, otherwise it's a bit embarrassing. Um, and, and so, the idea of compressed sensing is that you have this nice phase transi transition where when you don't have enough samples, you don't recover anything. When you, have, you cross the threshold and you have enough samples, you always recover the signal and you have some kind of phase transition here where sometimes you're lucky, sometimes not, okay? When A is taken randomly. Uh, and it turns out that if you compute, and computing the condition number is not that simple. So you can write things and, and identify the fact that the same quantity controls both complexity and statistical performance estimates, but computing this quantity is not that trivial. But if you can approximate it, you can see that the phase transition, there is also a phase transition for the condition number, not surprisingly, of course, because this thing is equal to the uh, 
classical statistical performance measure for which we know there is a phase transition, but numerically you observe the same phase transition. And this phase transition does materialize in the complexity of uh, various optimization techniques uh, for solving these compressed sensing problems. So what you notice empirically and people, what people have noticed since the very early work of Dono and Seg, for example, a long time ago, uh, is that whenever you're close to the phase transition, you're going to have to do a lot more numerical work than when you're outside of the uh, 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 phase transition uh, uh, zone. Okay? Yes? The red curves are like what? Are the uh, standard plus minus one standard deviation on a certain number of random instances of A. So one way of generating matrices A that satisfy these uh, restricted eigenvalues, uh, uh, eigenvalue conditions uh, with high probabilities to take them at random. And so this is averaged uh, over, I don't know, I think it's 100 um, instances of the matrix A. And, and there's uh, some asymmetry between these graphs and this graph. And this, this is because we've only really considered one half of the symmetric definition of the condition number. If we were to do the same thing, but using the symmetrized version of the condition, we'd get a graph that decreases here. But there's, here it's a region where you don't have enough information, so nothing happens, so it's not that interesting. What's more interesting is what happens here, and clearly you see that the condition number rises as you get near the phase transition region, and the computational complexity does exactly the same thing. The only puzzling aspect of this thing is when we use classical first order methods, we don't see this phenomenon. And the complexity is fairly flat, even though the theory tells us it, things should rise as the condition number rises. And it's not here because it was just a flat line, uh, but this is where an area where the, the numerical uh, 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 behavior of the methods is not aligned with what the theory tells us. Okay? Um, that's it, just to sum up. Um, so the idea was to produce um, data-driven complexity bounds on classical optimization uh, problems. Uh, so the first one we got was this affine invariant optimal in some cases bound on the complexity of the optimal method by Nesterov. And the second is this direct link between the complexity of compressed sensing problems and their statistical performance. Okay? There's a long list of open problems that I'm happy to discuss over uh, whatever drink you like. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>